Hello and welcome to another edition of Azure Every Day. My name is John Bloom. I'm a lead consultant at Pragmatic Works Consulting and I would like to talk today about data governance. Because of the size of the content for data governance, I've actually split it into two videos, this being the first. So let's go ahead and get started. A little bit about me. Uh, I started with data in 96 as a programmer, uh, business intelligence and architect. I've worked in the Azure Stack, Microsoft BI, Hadoop, and Power BI, and a variety of other reporting tools. I've been working on a computer since 1983 as a kid. I started consulting in 2014 professionally, although I had a side business bloom consulting since 2000. I've worked at Pragmatic Works Consulting since 2018. When we talk about data governance, there's really three pillars. There's the people, the processes, and the technology. The people consist of a data governance board, a data steward, and then the processes is uh, what are the steps to ensure that the data is stored, processed, and archived and protected. So basically, to run any business, there are certain steps that need to occur. And when we dive into these data projects, we have to formalize them, document them, and build them into our technology. Speaking of technology, what are the tools that we use to govern the content and the metadata? So that, you know, early on in reporting, we typically had a database, and that database had a reporting tool, and those are the only two objects within the, the framework. But as technology has grown over time, data has become a strategic asset. There's so many different applications, and we need a structure to formalize the, the entire package so that we can have a framework in which to build. What are some of the benefits of the data governance? Well, data-driven organization. Most companies today have become data-driven and the fact that they view data as an asset to manage the business. We also have a centralized single source of the truth. It also gives us a leverage for best practices to make sure we're uh, complying with uh, you know, how the industry is doing it. So anyone, a new developer starting on a project six months in can just hit the ground running. We also use a consistency uh, so that we have code reviews. We, we adapt to predefined processes and repeatable patterns. So the code should be aligned and uniform throughout the duration of the project. We also have transparency in that uh, the business unit, the, the people, the sponsors, whoever's funding the, the effort for the data initiative, they have access to the, the processes along the way so that they're involved. That wasn't always the case. Early on with the COBOL programmers, it was sort of a silo. Uh, they did the coding, they did the data, and they met with the business. They'd go off for six months and produce uh, a result, and the business was typically excluded. That's no longer the case with our agile methodology. They're, they're pretty much baked into the entire process with quick wins over time and then build from there. It also gives us an opportunity to secure the data. As you know, securing the data is very important so that uh, we can protect our asset at rest and flight and also when viewed. We also have a need for the catalog, which is basically a data dictionary that allows the end users of self-service to see and, I, and know what they're actually viewing. Another component of benefit is the audit trail. We could see what happened by when. Uh, we could see when processes failed, what was the hiccup that caused it, and try to fix those over time. We also have change management and the fact that the code has to be in development. It moves to QA or test and then it moves to either pre-prod or production. And we need a mechanism and we typically leverage uh, the client's uh, you know, methodology with the change tickets and, and such so that um, typically we hand off the final result and let them move it to prod uh, as we don't want to typically be involved in the production data uh, for protection. But sometimes we do, it's just a matter of uh, the project. We also need to incorporate the disaster recovery. As you know, things happen over time, hiccups, and we need to make sure that the data uh, is saved as well as how fast can we get it back up and running, what is critical for running the business, and what's nice to have. Obviously, we want source control to not lose our code over time and also see changes, integrate some of our DevOps, have repeatable patterns. So the data governance boards basically they're responsible for the data initiative, the asset, and that they make sure that the projects stay on track. Um, they basically sit atop of the, of, the, of the hierarchy, and beneath that is the data stewards. And basically, they meet from time to time. It's usually a, a appointed role, uh, perhaps one person delegated from HR, accounting, sales, IT, what have you. And those people meet periodically. They make key decisions. For example, uh, they do definitions like what is the definition of a customer, of a product, and, and any any implication that could cross boundaries between the domains. So they meet periodically and that's their function. 
some of the roles of the data governance board they assume ownership of the uh, typically the modern data warehouse approach it could be on premise or in the cloud um, they're selected to be participants of the board it could change over time it could be a, a matrix role where um, different people slide in to the meetings at different times based on availability some of the responsibilities is they oversee the implementation and maintenance and they keep it on track they evaluate and make key decisions presented by the data stewards. Like I said, uh, a lot of times we need uh, decisions made on, on processes or, or how we're going to structure data, perhaps hierarchies. You know, a lot of, a lot of organizations have different hierarchies and, and they're, they flush out the, um, the hierarchies so that it's custom to the, their organization. And they help facilitate these uh, decisions and they trickle down. The next role we'd like to talk about is the data steward, and a data steward is assigned per domain. So you could have a person for HR, you could have a person for sales, or you, you could be more segmented or even uh, more specialized. But these data stewards are assigned for that domain, and they have a key role in the implementation of the data warehouse uh, because they're responsible for a variety of tasks, such as uh, the data quality. So a lot of times they're tasked with some of the quality assurance in some organizations that don't have a formal QA responsibility. Uh, they also are responsible for the accuracy, the completeness, and the consistency of that data. So basically they understand the data better than anyone. So that's why they're tasked with some of that um, internal domain knowledge that may, may uh, be overlooked by a developer. They also manage the metadata to make sure that it's up to date. And there's a variety of uh, reasons why we have the data steward. It's a key role, and like I said, it's assigned per domain. And, and they can overlap, uh, but it's better when they have uh, specific to that domain so that you have one person to go to. The third layer of the hierarchy of the uh, data governance, as far as people, is are the data custodians. And the data custodian is basically anyone who has access to the data or the network or, or anybody who can come in contact with the, the actual data. So they're responsible for the custody, transport, and storage of that data, its implementation of business rules, as well as it's not a single person, it's a team typically. And, and a lot of times we'll have an architect who's responsible for the, you know, the, the framework of, of the data warehouse and how it changes over time. And they have to be, you know, account for a variety of, of factors, keeping the project on, on track. We also have the DBAs whose typical function is to back up and restore assigned permissions. We have the modeler who creates the facts in the dimension so the architect may construct the framework and the, the model is the person who implements it and it, it could cross boundaries and then we have the extract transformation and load developer a lot of times on prem it's ssis integration services or in the cloud we use data factory we also have a report developer you know a variety of report tools out there so we, we're responsible for all that uh, and also the quality assurance it's typically assigned to the data steward but it's a it's a teamwork and they have access to the data and technical processes to sustain the integrity. They work hand in hand with the data stewards and perhaps the data governance board to implement the new rules. So if we were to look at the high, high level uh, diagram here, the data governance board is at the top of the pyramid. They meet, review, discuss, and make decisions that trickle down to the data steward who's assigned per domain, who's responsible for perhaps security, uh, validation of the reports, interaction between the the IT, the business intelligence team, and, and the business. And then lastly, we have the data custodians, who's a team of DBAs, architects, ETL developers, data modelers, and report writers. So this is actually split into two Azure Everyday videos because of the length of content. This is the first of two. If you would like to discuss data governance in more detail or have questions on Azure, please click the link below or send us an email or we talk to you on the phone. So thank you very much for your time and we appreciate it and have a great day. Music